Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, so glad to welcome you here tonight. Um, as you heard, we are recording tonight's event. And um, that's so that we could share it with those that are unable to attend. I'm Patricia Sibilia. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Albany County. And on behalf of the League and our co-sponsors, Zero Waste Capital District and Sustainable Albany, I'd like to welcome all of you to our event tonight. First, we have our three expert panelists, and we have an extra special guest tonight, Dea Schlossberg, who's the director of the film, who we are so excited could join us. And all of you who decided to spend tonight um, um, talking about this important discussion about plastic. I trust everyone by now has seen the film and was as blown away as I was when I saw it. But before we begin tonight, let me just remind everyone of some basic Zoom etiquette. So please keep yourselves on mute. If you do have questions, please put them into the chat. We're monitoring the chat and we'll pass along the questions. And if you know how, you can actually change your view. It's up to you to speaker view. So you can see the person who's speaking instead of all of the many attendees that we have coming on. So I'd like to take a minute to talk about the League of Women Voters and the important work we do. First, we're all volunteer organization at the local level. You may know us for our voter services work, where we get people registered to vote, we conduct candidate forums, like we're currently finalizing the planning on now for June, for the June primary elections. And for our Vote 411, you get the 411 website, which is our one-stop online voter guide that allows a user to see what their individual, individual ballot will look like when they type in their address and what the candidates have to say for themselves in their own words. But we also put on programs like this to educate and inform the public on important topics. And following the event, you will receive a brief survey so we can understand how effectively our programs are serving you and to improve them going forward. The League could always use more support, either by adding new members or by financial donations. So if you find value in tonight's program, I ask that you go to our website, lwvalbany.org, and learn more about us and the work we're doing. And now, without further delay, I'm pleased to turn it over to one of our very active volunteers, Christine Promomo, who will be our moderator for this evening. Take it away, Christine. Hi, everybody. This is just a very exciting program. And um, I think I've watched this film three times now. And every time I watch it, I'm like, just pick up and learn something more. Just motivates me to kind of keep moving with all of this advocacy work that we need to do. Um, I think it's just fabulous. We've got this coup tonight, as, as uh, Patricia said, we have Adaya Schlossberg, who actually lives in Schenectady now, and she is the director, producer of this amazing film. Um, we're going to have her talk for a couple of minutes in a, just in, about, you know, what motivated her to do the film. Uh, then there's a little short video about the story of plastic review. It's like maybe four minutes. It's a really fun um, animation, which uh, you know, will be available later in the link if you want to share it with others. If you have grandkids, it's really in school age kids, it's a great little video. The, um, the program is going to flow pretty well in terms of the panelists, um, the three panelists we have, Alexis Goldsmith from the Sanctuary for Independent Media, Tina Lieberman from um, Zero Waste, Albany and Ann Ernst from Sustainable Saratoga, our three expert panelists, they'll be introducing themselves. And uh, then we are going to have the questions and answers that are going to be available to uh, the panelists. We'll be at, you know, the questions you put in the chat. And then uh, we're going to have something fun at the end, a little show and tell um, how we can all maybe do some things today to help reduce our use of waste and plastic waste. And then I'll turn it back over to Patricia and uh, she will wrap things up for us tonight. Um, so I'm gonna show the quick little video here and then I'm gonna turn it over to Daya to talk about this little film, the wrong one. I'm sorry guys, that's at the end. <laughs> here we go.
And while that's coming up, I'll just remind everyone, you can see that we have closed captions on. If they are annoying you in any way, you can turn them off by just clicking on them and there's a way to do that. Sorry guys, did it, it said it did it come up because I have a not a good internet connection at my house. I apologize. Let me see if I can um, help us out. Hold on one sec. I have to get the link first. Christine, I it's think you have the wrong one. That's, this is a 54 minute PBS news hour. Alrighty, that's because it went past the little one that I had. I apologize, guys. I, like I said, I have a very bad internet connection here. So that might be the issue. Hold on, I'm this trying. And I mean, I got, I have it now. Okay. There we go. Oh dear. <laughs> I think I am not going to be able to do this due to bandwidth issues. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can do it. One second. I am so sorry. Yeah, that's all right. I, we all know what to... that's like. <laughs> I live kind of out in the middle of nowhere, so. Okay, hold on, and I, I will share my screen. Thank you, Patricia. Trisha, did you um, optimize the audio component? We don't have sound. Got it. Hold on. I didn't realize. <laughs> let me let me roll back the video first, so we can start it again. I thought it was my computer. <laughs> no, it's it's me because I didn't share the audio. You could see the screen. That's just me being bad. So hold on one sec. I'll roll it back. And this time I'll share it with the audio. That would be helpful. Thanks. Optimize for video clips. And here we go. Giant trash island in the ocean. Or that poor sea turtle and the straw. Maybe you've even heard how plastic is being found inside the fish we eat. The plastic crisis gets a lot of attention, but the headlines usually focus on the plastic that ends up in the environment. And that's just part of the story. The truth is, plastic has a whole life cycle that's hidden from view. One that harms people and the planet from start to finish. Let's start at the beginning. Plastic is made from fossil fuels like oil or fracked natural gas. Extracting those fossil fuels and turning them into plastics creates a lot of pollution. Pollution that most often affects marginalized communities nearby. As we've gotten better about using less oil and gas to clean our lives, the fossil fuel industry found a lifeline in plastics. In fact, oil and gas companies are doubling down on plastic production, with plans to build or expand over 300 petrochemical plants in the U.S. alone by 2025. But these companies already produce more plastic than we can use. So where's all that plastic going? A lot of it's flowing into new markets in places like Asia, Africa and Latin America. Because more than any other product category, plastic isn't driven by the demand for it, but by the supply. Corporations like Unilever, Nestle, and Procter & Gamble 
are aggressively marketing single-use plastic products around the world. These companies go to places like Indonesia, where I live, and push their products onto communities that just aren't prepared to deal with all that plastic. Maybe they're used to using natural packaging. Maybe they live on a tiny island without a system of waste collection. And on top of that, countries in the global north are shipping their own plastic waste into these countries too. When you add that all up, it's no wonder so much of this plastic ends up in the environment. And globally, that's where a whopping 32% of plastic packaging ends up. 40% goes to a landfill, where plastic just piles up for future generations to deal with. And 14% is incinerated. Incineration is a nasty business, producing toxic smoke and fly ash. <coughs> These super expensive facilities depend on plastic to burn everything else. It is oil and gas after all. So they want to see more plastic, not less. Yahoo! Then there's recycling. Unfortunately, it's not the solution that many people think it is. Just 14% of plastic packaging gets recycled and only 2% is effectively recycled, meaning it becomes something as useful as before. The rest is downcycled into something worse. And most recycled plastic is only recycled once before ending up in landfills, incinerators, or the environment anyway. So it turns out that we can't burn, bury, or recycle our way out of this problem. And we can't just scoop all that plastic out of the environment either. That's like trying to bail out a bathtub with a teaspoon while the tap is on full blast. So how about we turn off the tap by shutting down the plastic machine? That means passing policies that create systemic change, like phasing out the single-use plastics that pollute the most, ending the fossil fuel subsidies that are fueling big plastic, and holding companies responsible for the plastic waste they create. That's how we can achieve our vision of a zero waste future, where all of our products and packaging can be reused or repaired, effectively recycled or composted, and ultimately how we create a sustainable circular economy that works for both people and the planet. Visit storyofplastic.org to learn more and take action. Thanks, Patricia. It's just uh, kind of the review of the film we all saw. I'm, I'm leaving my video off, guys, because I think it's just going to bog things down. So I apologize for that. Um, it's Christine from Momo speaking. So I um, now like to have uh, Daya who briefly give us a description of her motivation and goals in producing this film. Um, I'm really excited to hear how she did this and why. All right, thank you so much for having me and for sharing the film with the community here. Um, I'm a recent transplant from New York City, um, but my, I have family up here um, and I'm really excited to be here and meeting some of you. Um, and I'd like to get more involved in, in this issue in the community because um, I really just have a kind of a global perspective on it. Um, so my background is as a documentary filmmaker is um, looking more at uh, climate change and social justice kind of issues. Um, and when the executive producer of, one of the executive producers of this film um, approached me to direct it, I wasn't, this was like eight or nine years ago. I wasn't um, super excited to work on a plastic film because I, um, I didn't see as, I didn't see it as intertwined um, with climate and and pressing um, human rights issues, um, and I didn't feel like I had much to bring to the table. But as the next few years progressed and policies changed and it become it became more and more connected to um, fossil fuel and chemical extraction, um, then my work started to overlap the the plastic industry world and, and the plastic work, anti-plastic work. Um, and at, at that point, um, I realized that there wasn't really another another film out there that connected all these dots. Um, also looking at 
impacts along the, the whole chain of production and at the tail end and how um, the the cycle of, of plastic pollution and um, and and recycling in many cases depends on um, global poverty and really uh, takes advantage of of changing markets and and people who are who are um, generally in the global south um, for this for this pr to, problem to exist and to keep being a problem. Um, so connecting all of those different dots was was the my main um, my main goal in making this film and not having it be all these isolated issues, but just as we featured the Break Free from Plastic movement partners in the film, um, they start they recently started talking to each other on a global level and and informing each other's work so they're all more effective. Um, and that's what we wanted to do with the film is bring all of these narratives together and interweave them um, to tell the, the full picture and just show that every everywhere you look um, in this net, it's connected to everywhere else. It is. And um, yeah, so I, I, I I mean, I was I was blown away working on the film. What I was learning, um, getting to travel to all these places and, and speak with these amazing people um, who were sharing their own work and their own stories with us, and it just felt like um, an amazing opportunity to to elevate their their voices and their work. Um, You're doing that, that's for sure. Zaya. This is an amazing film. And uh, I, I hope it's, if, if, you know, I don't know, how long ago did it come out? Um, it was released in late 2019 in, fe okay. in the festival circuit. And then it came out on uh, the Discovery Channel um, last Earth Day. Okay, that's wonderful. I think more and more people need to see this film. Um, we're one of the groups that I'm involved in. We're showing this film and talking it up too. So, uh, and if connecting the dots is, is is an amazing accomplishment because you know it's what we seem to be learning now with this entire thing it's this whole circle and you did it so well so thank you for joining us tonight and uh talking about this and we will be seeing you again i'm sure <laughs> because um the league does have a very active environmental advocacy group um so alexis goldsmith is with us uh she is um i've gotten to know her through her work uh, with the Sanctuary for Independent Media, but now she is um, works for the Beyond Plastics organization, Judith Thanks organization. And um, she's just uh, become this incredible advocate. And I'd like her to talk about the story of plastics and how she's engaged with this very, very critical movement. Thanks, Christine. I feel a little funny um, summarizing the film when we have the filmmaker here, um, <laughs> but maybe it'll be helpful to hear somebody how they've interpreted it. I think, um, uh, thanks for introducing me. I'm the national field organizer at Beyond Plastics. I used to be the radio coordinator for the Sanctuary for Independent Media and did a lot of reporting on the petrochemical industry and um, especially the, pe the petrochemical build out in the United States. Um, I think something that this movie really does for audiences is show the life cycle impacts of plastic. Um, it's one thing to buy a bottle of like a plastic bottle of water and, you know, feel a little guilty about using it. But it's another to look at that bottle and imagine all of the steps and all of the impacts leading up to that bottle coming into your hand and then all of the impacts that it will continue to have after it is disposed of. So the connection um, where plastic starts at the fracking well, because in the US most plastic is, is manufactured from frac ethane to um, where it might end up half a world away in somebody's, literally somebody's yard um, and overwhelming their neighborhood. So that's one thing that the film uh, really does. And I think the second thing 
well, <laughs> there's several, but connecting um, plastic to the issue of climate the climate crisis and all of the impacts that it has on the climate crisis that isn't widely discussed. Um, and then I think the third thing that it does is really bring to mind the labor issues of plastic. Um, well, of course, the, the waste pickers and um, all of the issues that that causes, but also the people who work in the incinerators and the landfills and the ethane crackers and in the fossil fuel industry, they are the most exposed and the least protected. And it doesn't matter if they're in the US or in India, they're still breathing those emissions um, from this industry. So that's what um, stands out to me is the labor impacts of plastic really need to be brought uh, to the forefront of the conversation as well. So uh, that's all I have for now. Looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Alexis. And yeah, the labor piece is something that I don't think many of us think about, um, especially now where a lot of the focus is on, you know, how to deal with all this waste. Uh, Tina Lieberman, um, you want to talk about your initiatives and zero waste, and you've just done amazing things in Albany. Oh, thank you. All right. So um, Zero Waste Capital District uh, is a coalition of organizations in the capital region and individuals who are focused on reducing waste. And uh, our, our, our coalition was born out of, um, and League of Women Voters, Albany County is one of the members. And uh, our, uh, basically our coalition was born out of our work uh, helping pass the polystyrene styrofoam ban for single service uh, food containers and packaging in this, the Albany County. So um, we met, we fought, <laughs> we eventually won <laughs> that battle. And, um, and that, and that I, I think um, helped us all focus on what, what else could we be doing here in the capital region uh, to reduce waste. And it's been a journey um, of learning. And I, I, I would say the story of plastics has informed that journey because I think we started out with uh, trying to get people to recycle more. And um, I think we're coming around to seeing that recycling is not going to be the answer. Uh, that, that, you know, I love that phrase, you know, turn off the tap. Um, we've got to look at where it's coming from and, um, I think for me, the story of plastics pointed out that we've been made as the consumers to feel guilty uh, for, uh, you know, uh, you know, throwing, you know, we were supposed to be the ones to clean up. We're the ones who are supposed to um, focus on litter and focus on recycling more. And in all these decades, we still only achieved a 9% recycling rate in the United States. So obviously recycling isn't gonna be the answer. And then of that, you, you know, the, I think the, the film pointed out really clearly that the stuff that we think we're recycling really isn't recyclable at all. Uh, and it's just ending up in other countries or here being burned and, and creating all kinds of emissions. So um, recycling isn't the answer um, and it's not up to us to solve the problem and, um, it's not, you know, and if I stop using straws, is that going to solve the problem? So I think we're, we're all learning that we have to shift the focus onto the producers and onto legislation, which will stop the producers uh, massively. I mean, I think we also learned uh, when Albany County passed the, the polystyrene ban, and then it also just, I don't know, a couple of years after passed a, uh, a straws, um, and stirrers and plastic utensils only upon demand law, you know, that did a whole lot more than we could do through education individually, you know, to our small groups. So, um, so that has shifted our focus. And it's um, the thing that we've embraced most recently is uh, composting. Actually, you know, taking organics, taking the food waste, reducing food waste in initially, and then taking those food scraps and gathering them and turning them back into soil. You know, so they don't go into the landfills, they don't contribute to our waste problem and they don't generate methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, and taking them, putting them back into our local soil and then growing nutrient 
dense food with it, particularly in poor neighborhoods that are food deserts. That we know is a win-win. We know we can take the food scraps. We know we can remove them from our waste. You know, recycling is, right? We only think one and two, one, numbers one and two are really being recycled. And God knows everything else might just be getting burned in people's backyards. That's a really amazing synopsis, <laughs> Tina, which you, you've been involved in this for years. And yeah, I, I have been a little bit involved in the zero waste you know, um, a movement. Um, and I was very impressed when you had your, your fair, your zero waste fair it was what, two years ago now? Um, is your organization going to have that again? Uh, we have a virtual, um, we're going to have a panel discussion about all of the uh, things now going on in the capital region to promote composting. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks like, you know, uh, a lot of things are happening. Last week, Albany launched its voluntary composting program with uh, three options for, for residents and uh, a lot of encouragement from the city, which is terrific. So for encouragement for backyard composting, uh, for we've got some community, free community drop-off sites uh, open now where anyone can go and drop off their, their food scraps and um, it'll be processed for them. And then we also have some paid pickup services and you know we're giving out free backyard compost bins and free kitchen bins when you sign up for any one of those. And now we have other communities in the capital region are are you know are either have some of these uh, facilities. We are we're starting to do a food scraps drop off in Colony just starting um, this Saturday actually at the Colony Farmers Market. Uh, if anyone goes there at the Crossings Park every Saturday morning, we'll, we you could drop off your food scraps there. So things are starting to pick up. Schenectady is interested. Troy has actually, they, they were the leader. They've always had a, a Saturday morning drop off and also at the Troy Farmer's Market. So um, we're gonna be having a virtual panel discussion uh, from, with representatives from all these different cities and communities uh, on June 2nd. Wonderful. Well, we'll look forward to seeing the registration for that. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, you guys typing in your questions in the chat, you can ask Tina if you have any questions about um, what is going on and how she's, all the work she's doing in the city of Albany with uh, Zero Waste Capital District. Uh, Ann Ernst, um, if you would unmute yourself and speak to us about your efforts. And I know you are um, a professor at Skidmore College, but given more of a background, a little bit more background. And you and I were both, I believe, taking the um, Beyond Plastics course with Judith Ank and Alexis this past spring. And I really enjoyed that. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, so I, I uh, teach in the Environmental Studies and Sciences program at Skidmore College. Uh, and among other things, I teach two courses on plastics. I have a, a 200 level course that I teach on the science of plastics. That's for non-science majors. And then I also teach a freshman seminar that uses both the science and the social issues surrounding plastics as a central theme for like how to do college. Like every, every incoming freshman has to take uh, a first year seminar. It can be on anything. And, and so you pick an area of expertise and use that as a guideline. So I, it's less sciencey, um, but it's a really good way to get students to start thinking critically. Um, so that's, that's my background in terms of Skidmore. And then I'm also on the board of Sustainable Saratoga, which is a, a group here in Saratoga Springs that works to advance sustainable practices um, using education and advocacy, both in Saratoga Springs and in the broader um, capital region. And so I, I'm on their board and I also do a lot of volunteer work for them. And one of the subcommittees of Sustainable Saratoga is, is Zero Waste. So, so we've done um, a number of various uh, projects uh, and push for different policy changes regarding composting and recycling. And, uh, I, I personally, uh, like, 
So the last time I taught the, my freshman seminar on plastics, it was in 2019. So I, I had a- What was the deal with that shirt? What did I say? Please, Pico, if you could stay on mute. I um, I have my students watch uh, the. As I have my student, I had my students in the past watch a plastic ocean, which is uh, it's if people are have seen this, it's it's a great um movie but it does focus on the downstream part right like what do we do with the waste here's the waste in the ocean and 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 what are the problems that are caused by it and so i really like the the focus in the story of plastic about all the upstream issues that really need to be addressed before we can really tackle uh, the problem with plastics and that's what i try and, and cover in my classes Sounds like some courses I would be interested in, <laughs> especially the science based for non-scientists. That's great. So we do have um, now the chance to ask our questions um, of the panelists. And I first though want to um, just circle back to Alexis uh, Goldsmith because I'd like her to talk a little bit about uh, Beyond Plastics, her other life yes. that she's involved in. Um, I'm not sure many people uh, here know what Beyond Plastics is, but it's a national project currently based out of Bennington College. And our president is our former EPA regional administrator, Judith Ink, and she's our environmentalist extraordinaire. Um, as was mentioned, we do offer a course through Bennington College on plastic pollution with an emphasis on public action. Um, so not just feeling hopeless, but feeling empowered that you can do something. Uh, registration for the next course opens next week, shameless plug. Um, but mm -hmm. we uh, use our policy expertise to advocate for change at every level of government and we use our public action expertise to advocate for change at every level of society. So we have a lot of different projects that we're working on and um, there is legislation uh, to tackle the plastics issue that I would love to talk about. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm just looking in the chat there where uh, there's some uh, comments uh, by one of the participants and I'm going to throw this out. I'm not sure uh, if that would be a question maybe more geared toward you, Alexis. In the short, the messaging about plastic production that's driven by demand, not by demand so much, but by the supply. Can you kind of expand on that a little more? Yeah, I mean, we saw in the short video that more than 300 new petrochemical facilities are in the works since I, I think 2010. And this is really being driven by the fracking boom in the United States. Um, natural gas and natural gas liquids can be produced very cheaply. The waste from that process can be disposed of very cheaply. And so what you're left with is a glut of very cheap um, ethane and natural gas and other natural gas liquids, particularly methane, um, which is, as we know, very impactful on the climate. Um, so this glut of cheap ethane is what's driving plastic production because um, it's another market for oil and gas to, to put their product into. So um, it's triggering this expansion of infrastructure like ethane crackers, but also pipelines um, injection wells, um, refineries, all of these uh, infrastructure projects that support ethane crackers that have a lot of impact on the environment and on labor. So it's really not a consumption, it's production uh, flooding the market. And as long as um, it continues to be cheap for oil and gas to produce plastic, plastic will be the cheapest product on the market for packaging. Yeah, I'd like to add, um, <clears throat> I think a good example is look at all the lettuces and salads that are now packaged in clamshells. 
did, did you really need your lettuce to be packaged in a clamshell? But now you, I've gone into supermarkets where I don't even have a choice anymore. Um, it's not even in a bag. It's always in a clamshell now. It's just incredible. So who's driving that? It's not driven by our need because I would buy it if it was in a bag or if it was just put out as a head, right? If those were my only choices. So the, 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 cheapness and the, the 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 fossil fuel companies the petrochemical companies themselves are driving this by convincing somewhere along the line that all this stuff has to be packaged and making it really really cheap and virgin plastic because because as alexis said uh, frac gas is so cheap and ethane is basically a waste product of fracking so it's it's like, okay, what are we going to do with this? Let's make some money off it. Let's make plastics. So they make the virgin plastics and they're cheaper than the process of recycling. So we can't, we can't win with recycling. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for both of you. Um, and I do, I, I, the same thing when I'm in the supermarket, it's, it's like, I try, I look for things that aren't in plastic or in those mesh bags. And it's really difficult. I'm really glad it's summer, so I'm growing my own vegetables and don't have to buy stuff in the supermarkets. So, um, so we have another question. Um, how do we even begin to address getting companies who make this stuff do something about it? Subsidies sound like a good idea, but um, not sure that that's really the answer. And actually companies aren't gonna do the right thing. So um, we know that in most cases. The other issue is, you know, why are we subsidizing, subsidizing these businesses if we can't get them to do something about it in the first place? Anybody have want to weigh in on that of the three of you? Four, four of you, even Daya could even weigh in. Alexis, you want to talk about the uh, legislation? Sure. I mean, <laughs> It's all about cost for these companies, you know, as long as they continue to be profitable or profitable on paper, I'm not entirely convinced that ethane crackers are financially viable. Um, we will continue to see the market flooded with plastic. So ending subsidies for fossil fuels might go away a long ways. Um, regulating the waste that's generated by fracking facilities uh, might go a long way. Like if they actually had to dispose of it, if it was more costly to dispose of in a way that actually reflected how dangerous the waste is, um, then it might be too expensive. Um, but there is legislation specifically directed at um, plastic in the federal government right now. It was introduced into con reintroduced into Congress in March. It's called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And um, it has a lot of uh, measures in it, including a nationwide ban on plastic bags, um, reducing um, single use plastics, things like that. It also includes extended producer responsibility, which shifts the waste uh, disposal and recycling costs onto the producer of the packaging. Um, and I think the most important aspect of this bill is it uh, places a moratorium on new and expanded plastic production facilities, um, which given the fact that we, <laughs> if you look at plastic production as a graph, we're, we're here and this is the future. I don't know if this is reversed for you. <laughs> we are not on a plateau right now when it comes to plastic production. It is increasing exponentially and it will continue to increase um, because uh, more money continues to be invested into manufacturing plastic. So the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act puts a pause on, on that practice um, and directs the EPA to really scrutinize the permits for um, these plastic production facilities. Um, I will note most people in this room are constituents of Representative Paul Tonko and Paul Tonko has not co-sponsored this bill. Um, we have urged him to time and again um, but I would encourage everybody to write to Congress member Tonko and ask him to co-sponsor this important bill. Um, and on 
May 26th, there is a national call-in day. The Break Free from Plastic Coalition US is um, pushing for people across the country to call their representatives and ask them to co-sponsor this bill. So that's one thing you can do is call Congress member Tonko. Thanks, Alexis. That is a very important bill. Um, and I've, I've actually seen a really good film on that as well on the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act uh, that was produced Last year, maybe Alexis, I'm thinking, but um, it really does get to the heart of you know what we must do, and not just here but globally. So I'm I'm kind of looking at the the chat here, and um, a couple questions have come in. Um, anyone feel they could address the approaches to extended producer responsibility? Is that a good idea? Is it not a good idea? And and can you explain briefly what it is about? What what is that? Is that Alexis again? <laughs> <laughs> it's a complicated topic. It really is. Okay. Um, and the devil's in the details. Uh, somebody pointed out in the chat that there is a extended producer responsibility bill introduced into the New York State Legislature. Um, and while we support uh, Beyond Plastic supports the spirit of the bill, there's a lot of problems with it as it's written. The devil is really in the details. So extended producer responsibility sets up a producer responsibility organization, which is tasked with um, managing the waste produced by the packaging and recycling it or disposing of it or reusing it in some way. Um, for example, and there's a lot of issues with how you give the PRO, the producer responsibility organization, that power because it's formed from the industry itself. Um, so oversight is a big issue. Another issue with the bill is um, is the is waste reduction in the spirit of the bill. For example, in the way the New York State bill is currently written, it would produce a fee per by weight of the waste, um, which we fear would encourage more plastic use because plastic is a lighter packaging than other materials. So that's just one example. So it's really important to get it right. Um, but I'm not an expert on extended producer responsibility. I just know that the idea is taxpayers are paying um, for the waste pickup and disposal of plastic and other packaging, be it aluminum or you know what have you, cardboard. Um, whether it's incineration, landfill, or recycling. And because of the excessive amount of plastic packaging that we don't have a choice of buying, as Tina pointed out, um, we're basically subsidizing the plastic industry by paying for that. So extended producer responsibility is meant to shift that cost back onto the, the producer of the packaging, like Coke, for example, or Nestle. Thanks a lot, Alexis. You did a pretty credible job there, I think. Um, not hey, having I, expertise. Sorry. Tina, do you have something to add? Yeah, just something that um, the commissioner um, of Department of General Services mentioned to me once, uh, that in Europe, uh, extended producer responsibility, one of the things it means is that um, the, the, the manufacturers of the packaging are responsible for it through uh, its disposal. So um, that has, or they get taxed on it or pay a fee or whatever. So it has forced them to consider the design right from the beginning. They've reconsidered uh, designing uh, the packaging to be less, you know, to, to create less disposal, which saves them money or to be recyclable, fully recyclable, or, or even compostable. Um, so it's that kind of pressure, but it's, I think it should be financial pressure that always seems to work the best, um, if not legislative pressure on them to force them to start thinking about the whole process because they'll be responsible for the, for the cost of disposal and instead of just dumping it on the, the cities, the municipalities and the taxpayers. Great, thank you so much. Um, I am just going to read a quick comment by um, one of the folks that put it in the chat that, uh, you know, there are um, struggles going on right now, a huge struggle in the construction of a, stopping a huge Formosa company plastic complex right in the middle of Louisiana in a Black community. 
So if anyone sees anything, reads anything about their struggle, um, this is exactly the kind of thing that we cannot allow happen. Um, it's going the wrong way. We're not even going to get level. We keep going up with the plastic production. Um, there's been a couple questions regarding um, high temperature, high tech burning of plastic bins to generate electricity. And I don't know if we have anybody on the panel who really is feels they're comfortable with the science of that and what it means. I, I mean, I know, I know there are, um, there are these I, very small, not yet to scale, um, not to a large scale technologies to take plastic and, and process it at such a high temperature that you can bring it back to actually have it be molecularly recyclable again. Um, but in all these cases, even with that high tech stuff or just plain incineration, uh, you're always going to have this problem associated with what are you burning? Because it's not just like, certainly plastics as they made really clear in the film, plastic, plastics are made from gas and oil. These are fossil fuels, we burn them for energy, but it's not pure carbon, right? We add plenty of stuff that we don't want burned and put into the atmosphere. When you burn plastics, you, you produce um, dioxins, you produce, you know, other carcinogens that are that you you make um, really high particulate matter unless you have great filters. Um, a lot of the incinerators are moving to poor countries where they're not going to have the same technology in place. And so they, I think a lot of there's some emphasis right on bow, but look, if we can do it in this clean way, but I think it's that same idea of like, well, it's clean coal, right? But that's not really a thing. Um, I think it just serves to distract from the really, really negative effects um, of incineration that tend to um, just be compounded with social justice issues because incinerators are always gonna be located in communities of color or in areas of high poverty. Exactly. So um, can you um, talk at all about uh, issues, current waste issues that we have in the capital region that are, have been in the paper, that are, most people are reading about that we should all be aware of? Um, and I would like to start with you, Anne. Um, would, are you aware of issues right in the capital region that we should be paying attention to when it comes to these issues? I know the big thing that Saratoga, Sustainable Saratoga is, is uh, one of the issues they're focusing on right now is the fact that there aren't any recycle containers um, in, in downtown Saratoga. Like there just aren't any <laughs> garbage cans. Um, and some, <coughs> some uh, there's a whole class at Skidmore in political ecology that did a semester long research into this topic. Um, the problem, as you can imagine, is whenever you have a recycle bin next to a trash bin, people treat them all like a big two trash bins right next to each other. Uh, and so there are a lot of challenges that they don't like. First of all, Saratoga doesn't necessarily want to give up the footage, you know, to put in a second container. And then even if they do, who's going to go through? I mean, Skidmore has problems with this. And this is like a group of fairly idealistic students who are willing to think, you know, recycling really clearly marked containers, and we still have tons of problems with contamination. So I think, I mean, it's silly in some ways to even say, well, we're really focusing on recycling since recycling is a terrible answer um, to this problem. But that is one of the big things Saratoga is focusing on right now. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know from my own personal experience, trying to even read the little numbers on the bottom of recycling, supposedly of plastics you can recycle if they're minuscule, they get smaller by the week, it seems, because there's only two types of plastic supposedly that can be recycled, all the rest just go in the garbage, right? Um, one and twos, is that right, Alexis? Those are the two types of plastics that you can recycle that are going to be recycled, the rest of them even though your, your company, waste management company or whoever it is says, yeah, you can recycle, you know, three, four, five, sixes, mm -hmm. they don't recycle them. They're not recyclable. Is that right? 
yes, that's generally true. Some neighborhoods accept number five, but um, generally just one and two. Yeah. And number number six is polystyrene, which basically almost never gets recycled, right. um, and it contaminates your recycling bin. So never put polystyrene in a in a single you know waste uh, recycling bin, single stream. Mm -hmm. So Tina's. Oh, you went mute, Christine. Oh yeah, you went. What, mute. A, what about <laughs> you're you're off mute now? I'm off mute. Um, what about any waste management issues in in the city of Albany? I know you're working on the you know elimination end, the zero waste end, the composting, but what's going on in the city of Albany that you're aware of? Uh, well, we recently had a, a pretty big, um, almost battle, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. Waste management um, has a transfer station for construction and demolition debris in the Port of Albany, uh, right in the South End neighborhood, which is an um, environmental justice neighborhood. And they had just applied to the DEC for a permit to bring in municipal solid waste garbage from eight surrounding counties to put there to house there and then to be able to transport them in larger trucks um, up to a facility near uh, um, a, a landfill near Saratoga. Um, and so, and possibly also to, be, we're not sure, possibly also to be burned in the um, uh, waste incinerator in Hudson Falls. So um, there was big outcry. Luckily our, our South End neighborhood and our city we're pretty sensitive to environmental justice issues after having had an incinerator, um, our own garbage incinerator in one of them, not, not so long ago. Uh, so there was an immediate outcry. Um, the mayor and a bunch of local assembly people jumped on it, spoke with the DEC. Um, League of Women Voters uh, drafted um, a comment and people were signing up left and right to, to speak at a public comment period. So uh, good news last week, um, Waste Management withdrew that application. So that was really good. And it really goes to show, they will try to cite things like this in environmental justice neighborhoods, in poor neighborhoods, counting on people not being organized in those neighborhoods. And um, when, you can, when, when you can get organized quickly um, and when people speak up for other people, and it, it really helps. Um, do you think so they're going to, you think they're going to come back and re-permit? <laughs> Who knows? Well, this, this is the second time they've tried to do this. So, okay. So <laughs> yeah, maybe <they'll> probably <laughs> try again. They'll yeah. probably try again. Ever um, vigilant. <laughs> I just think it's also important to mention that the incinerator in Hudson Falls is one of the oldest and most polluting it incinerators, is. right? Um, yes, it is. So that's in Warren County, and um, it's one of the dirty dozen of all the incinerators in the country, and it's number one in production of lead, uh, like, um, you know, it emits lead. And um, so Tracy Frisch, who's, who's in on this, um, she's attending this, this, meet, this meeting, this webinar, um, she has repeatedly explained that according to um, New York State um, health Department, Warren County has the highest per capita rate of cancer in New York State. So this is a good thing that to be shut down. Yep, it sure is. Um, so there is a couple more questions about um, putting issues with recycling and stop even bother, why bother? <laughs> Just throw them in your garbage. Um, in terms of reducing um, plastic use on a larger scale, is that even possible? Anyone have a, who would like to field that one? Well, Absolutely, it's possible. Um, we need reuse and refill programs and zero waste policies. Um, and this is a way to address the labor issue as well, because um, Gaia, where it, Dea put the, the link to Gaia in the chat, released a study just a couple months ago that zero waste policies generate 200 times as many jobs as landfills and incinerators. And that's because there's a lot of room for innovation and entrepreneurship. For example, um, diaper services. 
they were got long gone before I was born, I think. Now everybody uses disposable plastic diapers, but there was a time when you can use a reusable diaper and the laundry service would pick it up and wash it and, and bring it back to your house. So that's one reuse refill service that's gone away. And um, there's a lot of room for expansion and reuse and refill, packaging reduction, innovations in packaging. I mean, the sky's the limit, really. Um, I think one of the tactics that pl big plastics and big oil and gas uses to perpetuate the use of plastic is to constantly remind us that oil and gas is in everything we use and we can't live without it. But that's a lie. And um, it's a lie that they have used successfully, but we have the truth on our side. So yes, it's, it's possible. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there is another question um, about uh, single versus dual stream recycling, if that's being something that's considered in either Albany or in Saratoga. And you want to comment on that at all? Do you know with your work if that's happening? I don't, I don't know that they're considering changing from, I mean, there's just, we have uh, three different waste haulers who service Saratoga Springs and they all do single stream. Um, right, we've got waste management with Sierra, right, with Sierra. We've got um, twin bridges. I will say, like, I've had, um, I've toured Sierra Processing, and I've had the head of recycling from Casella come and talk to two different classes. So I've gotten a lot of information from them. I can't get anything from twin bridges. Like, I, as, I don't know if anyone uses them. Everyone seems like everyone in Saratoga switched to them. They don't answer their phone. They don't answer email. Like they'll answer emails that with the most generic stuff. I don't know what they do with their information or, or what they do with their recycling. Where I feel like I have a better sense of what goes on with the two other waste haulers. But so as far as <coughs> sorry, as far as I know, Saratoga is not looking at anything but the current uh, single stream uh, system that all the waste haulers in the area have in place. Yeah, I think I did read that um, about Twin Bridges. They read some things about them in terms of not really being forthcoming with information at all when people have I, asked. I wanted to go visit them. They won't answer. They just yeah. sent me a thing saying, oh, are you interested in Twin Bridges? Please sign up here. Like, no, right. I want to talk to someone. I want to come see your plan. I want to, I want to have someone come talk to my class. Like, I want more information and they just won't do anything but say, thanks so much for your interest. Please see our website for your signing up. Right. Tina, do you want to comment on that too? And then I have another question in the chat. Yeah, sure. Um, so in Albany, um, you know, change is slow. They, they had finally worked very hard to adopt the single stream and have been working very hard to educate people about what should go in the bin and what shouldn't. So, um, and then when the whole, um, China sword policy happened and China stopped taking our recycling. It, it really, um, it went from the city being paid for the recycling to now the city having to pay for it. So um, I do hope that we eventually come around to setting up dual stream again and, um, and separating out. Certainly glass would be one of the first things uh, we should look at separating out of paper. I would say also because paper could have value and glass could have value if sorted out. Um, and um, we did just start at Honest Weight Food Co-op, uh, working with Honest Weight Food Co-op, some of our volunteers at Zero Waste Capital District uh, started a glass recycling program for like a, a separate out your clear glass and take off the cap and you can drop it off at Honest Weight. It's sort of a pilot. We're experimenting with it. Um, there is a company called Tomra that they take the deposit bottles and they actually do gather it. They pay for it, although it's very little, like $15 for like a ton or two tons. Um, but, um, but they will actually recycle it. So, so we're starting to experiment, see what's out there and what we can do. I believe Kingston or Ulster County um, is moving toward dual stream. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if it's just the city of Kingston or if it's uh, the county itself moving toward that. I don't know if anyone can weigh in on that. Is anyone from that part of the, the area, capital region? So 
Another interesting question about um, federal government mandates. Um, could they, the federal government mandate all products be made only in number one and number two plastic to help have a cleaner waste stream from plastics? Is that something that you think is viable or even something that we could kind of be an interim step? What do you think, Alexis? Um, I think this is something that would probably fall into the responsibility of the extended producer responsibility or the producer responsibility organization. So that's why another reason why it's it's so important to get that law set up right before you pass it. Um, and somebody asked about the nickel deposit cans. Yes, they are recycled at a much higher rate. Um, so return your your aluminum cans and your glass bottles and your number two plastic bottle, your PET plastic bottles. Um, the BFF PPA also puts a national 10 cent bottle bill um, on, uh, on <laughs> these beverage bottles. Um, and when the deposit goes up to 10 cents in the return rate increases to like 92%. If you don't want to return them, just put them in a box outside your door and I guarantee a waste picker will come by and pick them up for you. And it's nice if you put them in a box separate, then they don't have to go through your recycling or your trash to get them. Great, thank you. So Tracy Frisch um, just put a comment in about Ulster County owning and operating its sorting facility for recyclables. So they only take dual stream. And then Kingston did go to single stream and took its recyclables out of the county. So um, they're, I don't know where they're going. Maybe we don't know. Um, they do want to get the city of Kingston to go back. It's gonna go back to a dual stream. So they're, they're making progress there. And uh, it's these little victories, I guess, that coming up the pipe that kind of give you hope and say, hey, if you can do it in my, that community, you can do it anywhere. Um, so um, we have also um, a question. Oh, you already answered that one, I think, very well, Alexis. The uh, emissions from the issues with recycling, just limiting our purchases and packaging, should we go back to doing anything with our plastics? What's the best way to deal with it? So when someone does want to know what dual stream means. Dual stream recycling. I think for me, I, I am not the expert, but it's when you separate your recyclables from your other garbage that's non-recyclable in separate containers or bins, and then your waste hauler is supposed to take it. And then when it gets to place like the uh, Sierra, they are actually recycling the items, separating and recycling. Is that right? Tina, were you and Anne, were you on that tour? You've been there. Is that what they do? Yeah, it's not that, I mean, it's not that you separate your trash from your recycling. Single stream is just putting all your recycling into one single collection. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and then, you know, cause think like when, like when I, when recycling first became a thing, right? Like when I was in college, everyone saved their paper bags cause you put your cardboard in one and your paper in one and your colored glass in one and your news, you know, everything was separated. Um, so dual stream is what I, I don't know exactly, but Tracy wrote it's paper and cardboard versus I guess other stuff containers, right? Is that, is that standard for, I don't really know, um, but it's single stream is when you're putting everything together. And I think then it just makes everyone think, well, I think it could be recycled. It just makes people feel really good about um, their waste instead of feeling guilty about it because you're like, well, I recycled it, it's fine. Um, I think that's why single stream is so popular. Everyone loves it. I remember my sister and her moved to Seattle like 30 years ago and, and they were kind of the vanguard with recycling. <laughs> they were, we were kind of like, what are you doing there? You're separating all this stuff out in separate, what a pain. She's no, 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 it's great. They have it well organized. So um, 
Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we're all trying our darnest, right, to do what we can do to reduce our own use. But I agree that, um, you know, we really have to look at the macro level here in terms of how um, to reduce the, the stuff in the first place. Um, so what would uh, be the next steps here? Does anyone have any other questions that uh, they'd like to ask? I don't know how we're doing on time, Patricia. Sorry, I, I think we were going to go to uh, questions until 7.45, so we do have a little bit more time. Okay, terrific. Christine, um, Christine, this is Paula. Can, can anybody talk about, I think there were a number of questions about the plastic bags and what really happens with them when we take them to the supermarket, you know, are they ending up in the trash someplace? Are they being sent to another country? Are they being burned? What really happens to the plastic bags? Well, anybody really know the answer to that on our panel? I think my understanding is they, they are largely um, downcycled into something um, like a bench or a bucket. Um, is that your understanding, Tina? Like they, like they're not, I don't think, if, as long as it's a, it's a, you know, grocery stores, they do collect them. Um, they're not really recycled. They're just downcycled into something. It just, it's not cutting off any demand for plastic bags. It's just, they're putting it into um, something else. Yeah, um, so New York State requires that um, that these, uh, you know, businesses like supermarkets and um, uh, pharmacies and whatnot that used to use plastic bags before the plastic bag ban, that they collect them and has told them that they still need to collect them. Um, I, I get mixed reports, but I have talked to someone who worked in the plastics industry with the and collected these plastic bags. And he told me that they were selling a lot of them to, I think it's called Trax, um, which right. is a business that's fairly local. It's in New York state. It's not, not, I don't think that's that far from here. And they are making it, as you say, they take these plastic bags and they turn them into um, plastic decking. And you, you're seeing a lot of that lately too. And which is, and also into plastic benches and whatnot. Um, so, and actually, if you look on their website, they have quite the collection of textures and colors. It's really quite attractive. So they are reusing it is my understanding, but I have also heard some people, in fact, yesterday, someone who told me that in their Hannaford, they heard from someone who works there that they just dumped them in the trash. So, um, I do get mixed reports, but I hope most of them do make their way into, you know, into being reused. So we do have a question about, you know, if we demand this reduction we in plastics and we go to other material, what would be better than plastic? What could we use to replace plastic that would not be um, harmful to the planet. Alexis, you have the answer for that? I don't have a one size fits all answer, but I think- A few answers. <laughs> you have a few, you have a few ideas. I think uh, number one, reducing packaging. There's just way too much packaging out, out there to begin with. Um, number two, there's lots of creative solutions. Um, Ecovative and Troy is making mushroom packaging that can replace styrofoam. I've seen um, banana leaves, uh, coconut shells being ground down and used as packaging hemp. Um, so sky's the limit and there's really a lot of room for investment there and creativity. Um, so <laughs> I think that will uh, the answer, though, is um, more reuse, refill, though. That's what I would emphasize. Reuse, refill, and just reduce the packaging. Right. And right now, that means going out of your way a bit and buying bulk when you can. Um, and, you know, Honest Weight Food Co-op is 
uh, uh, you know, I know I keep mentioning them, but it's a great <laughs> place to buy bulk. Um, may they make it easy for you. And you can, uh, you can get your shampoo, your conditioner, your dishwashing, you know, so you can just refill one bottle that you have over and over. Um, and and it, it, it does feel good to do that. Uh, there also, um, there's a lot of, it's encouraging. There's, there are podcasts that you can listen to about materials that are being developed that are bio-based materials, bio-based fabrics, um, bio-based packaging. Uh, so there's a lot of new engineers and new designers who are like Echovative who are coming up with sustainable solutions. We have to be careful that they really are sustainable and they're not greenwashing. Um, but they're, they're there, they're being developed. And uh, we have a lot of young people up and coming who are thinking about this. Yeah, I, I love Honest Way Food Co-op myself and for the same reason, <laughs> bringing back, you can, and I remember for a while there was some issues with being able to bring your own containers way back years ago that there was some health department issues. They got around that, that was great. So, um, and one of the things that I noticed that I buy these lasagna sheets from Italy, they come in this tray that is made out of cornstarch. So it's compostable. So, I mean, is, is that, you know, Alexis was saying there are other, you know, natural products that just break down and uh, are compostable. Um, uh, sorry, I just want to say that I love that there's so many different options for packaging besides plastic that really uh, opens the market for a lot of diverse um, people and diverse ideas to enter the market that is currently being cornered by plastic and by a small number of oil and gas executives. So it would really be economically beneficial to invest in alternatives to plastic packaging. Well, one of yeah. the things, one of, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Tina. Uh, I was just gonna say, uh, Alexis mentioned industrial hemp and, and that is really up and coming, right? Um, that's, the farmers can be growing that and making a good living as soon as we figure out and, and get the production um, capacity up so that there's a market for where they can, they can sell their industrial hemp. And another mm -hmm. ish, another one is bamboo. Uh, yes. because it's fast growing and it's um, re easily replenishable. It's, it's another good option for like, um, if you, if you, you know, need um, a spoon or, you know, that th those are good. They're reusable, but also could easily be compostable and, and replenished. Right. So what if we ask manufacturers to change? Does that, as, as consumers, I know there was a movement on for a while. I, I know I've signed petitions trying to get Amazon to reduce their use of packaging um, when they with shipping. Does that work? Does anyone think that works? <laughs> Alexis is smiling. If, I know, you're if you're tenacious enough. Yeah, you got to keep at it. A lot of people though would have to, right? I don't. I don't know that a lot of people have to. Um, you know, it takes a very small percentage of the population to cause uh, social change. No, oh, so we can all individually then maybe make a difference there. I yeah. know I went to a local store and asked them about, you know, they, they were double bagging something in plastic and I don't remember what it was. And I did ask and I just said, you know, is there some reason and what, you know, why? Oh, well, I don't know. We always did it that way. Well, yeah, we could change that. We don't need to do that. So they were amenable to doing that. But, um, and I, I guess even getting through to someone who's actually going to listen is hard with a big company. I do know that I, I, I did send uh, an email to the Chobani yogurt comment, you know, marketing PR people and said, you know, hey, do you guys realize that you have number five plastic in your containers you talk about? you know, your company being green and this stuff isn't recyclable. And I just got this like stock email back and, you know, so I don't know, I guess I, I'd still have to keep on them, right? Yes, and McDonald's is going full bore with doing their own. 
a campaign to stop using styrofoam. So it's happening. It's just maybe not happening fast enough. So everyone, um, thank you so much for your really, um, you know, in-depth questions and the answers that we've had from the panelists is great. Um, and we do have though some things that all of us could do maybe to try to reduce our use of plastic at the, at the beginning. It's not gonna be recycling. Um, I think Tina has a couple of items, a little show and tell that she was gonna have to show us. And then um, I had a couple of things myself that I learned from the Beyond Plastics class that I took. And then at the end, we will have the program. And when we send out the information on the program, there's gonna be a link to a Excel spreadsheet that's gonna list maybe 30 or more different companies where you can purchase these items if you decide you want to try to cut back on your own personal plastic use. So uh, Tina, take it away. Um, so yes, so it's, it's fun to share some of our tips with each other about how we reduce waste in our daily lives. And, you know, even though it's, it sometimes seems like just, as in, you know, you're, you're only one person, but I have noticed that, um, it, it does have an impact on the people around you and what other people do has an impact on me, things that I haven't thought about um, when I see other people going out of their way. For example, to use napkins, uh, cloth napkins. Um, someone did that with me once and you know they, they brought a cloth napkin to a picnic and I was like, yeah, I guess I could do that. And, and I started doing it, it's really easy to do and I just don't buy paper napkins anymore. Um, I love, um, so I mentioned buying bulk at um, Honest Weight for shampoo. So like I've personally decided I, I'm not gonna buy any new more, more new shampoo bottles. So I have this um, gray Poupon mustard bottle that I reuse and I just go and fill it with shampoo at, at uh, Honest Weight from their big bulk bin. And, and it, it does feel good and it's, it lasts a good long time. So that's just an example for um, when I'm, when I'm, if I'm eating, uh, doing, you know, takeout or whatever, I do bring my own utensil. Um, and I love this little spork thing that's made of bamboo. I keep it with me, you know, and it's, it, it, I have, I've given it out to friends and makes great presents and they, they keep it in their wallets or purses and it, it's great. Um, I think a lot of you probably know about reusable straws and, um, you know, they're not expensive at all. I have, you know, metal ones, you can get glass ones. Uh, they come with the little brushes. If you haven't seen that, there are whole little utensil sets that you can keep um, in your purse um, with knives and everything. So that's of course something. And um, so that you don't take plastic bags at supermarkets for your produce. Um, there are these lovely little bag sets you can buy. This one is cotton. Um, and once you get them, you know, they're reusable, washable, you'd never have to get them again. <laughs> That's always a nice part too. And um, toothbrushes is another thing that you can, you can, you don't have to buy plastic toothbrushes anymore. It's really easy to get bamboo ones now. So here's an example of bamboo toothbrushes. Uh, another great gift to give um, people, um, gets them thinking. And another thing that we had mentioned, um, was um, toothpaste. So, you know, a lot of people are trying to think about if they could send um, their to TerraCycle, their toothpaste tubes. And I think this, the simpler solution is now there are toothpaste tabs, like uh, uh, little tabs that you um, put into your mouth, it turns to toothpaste and you just, you don't, and they come in paper bags and you don't ever have to use a plastic toothpaste tube anymore. So those are some ideas for folks. Um, and I'm gonna also put in the chat, I'll put in a, a link to the toothpaste tabs. And um, I just wanted to mention for restaurants, there's also some programs that are being started in terms of reusable containers, uh, like I think it's uh, Go Green Durham, uh, where you sign up through an app and you get uh, a container that the restaurant will 
give you, and then, then you drop it back off at the restaurant's reusable container. So these are some of the ideas that are coming our way. And we just need more volunteers to make them happen. Right. Those are all great, great ideas. So um, when I uh, started thinking about reducing my plastic use to uh, Tina, I also heard about these nifty things. I'm going to start my video and hopefully my computer will not seize up. These are shampoo and conditioner cakes. And I bought them online from this company. They came in a cardboard box. There was nothing around them. They said that they do not, um, they are very eco-friendly and they're in that list that they're great. They smell awesome. They're actually great little sachets. Another, you know, if you don't want to do the, the liquids. So I haven't used it yet because I wanted to show it tonight. Didn't want it to be all gooey. Um, also this little, anybody know what this is? Any ideas? <laughs> This is something I learned from taking the class Beyond Plastics. A woman was talking about these that was on the class. It's a Cora ball. And this little gizmo is something that you throw in your washer because it then collects microfibers from our clothes, which goes, of course, catches all that stuff that microfiber and plastic pollution that goes into our waterways. So um, I also that's in the in the website, but they're too small for us to see. And you know, this one I've used probably a hundred times, and I've pulled out like chunks of microfiber linty things. If you wash items of clothing that are polyester, you know, that's plastic. <laughs> so that stuff is shedding. I mean, again, you know, thinking about where we buy our clothes and what we wear on our clothing, maybe looking more at natural fibers again, um, too, to uh, eliminate some of that use, keeping the microfibers out of our waterways. And then instead of um, using the dryer sheets, plastic dryer sheets, or the liquid fabric softeners, these are little wool balls. They came in a set of six, they go in my dryer. So these are what keep my clothes from wrinkling from, they're from New Zealand, I think. They're, they're made of wool. They also from any kind of static. So there's another little thing that you can try. And then lastly, um, plastic sandwich bags. We don't like to do that. We, if any of us are brown bagging anymore, people aren't going, maybe when you go back to work it's with COVID, silicone lunch bag sandwich bag seals up and it's you know when you close it I mean literally it's it's very tight and you just wash it out and there's another saving on plastic I've once used one sheet of saran wrap 20 times <laughs> I tried to re reuse them and the same thing with my aluminum foil if I have to use it I try not to but when I do I wash it off and I hang it up on a little clothesline I have in my laundry room, let it dry and I use it again. So I don't know how much impact I'm making, but so that's our little show and tell. Um, anybody um, that wants to take advantage of all these little goodies, they're going to be in the chat. We'll also put a, I'm sorry, in the links and in the chat. Then we also have a video that I found. Um, if anyone watches the America Test Kitchen cooking show, there's a, a young woman named Lisa McManus who does this gearhead program on the show, but she has done with another woman of YouTube about the best alternatives to single use plastics in the kitchen. And some of those were really interesting. So great ideas for all of us. And Maybe it's not a huge impact as Tina said, but at least we feel good that we're doing something. And people are, you know, they ask you, oh, what's that? What are you doing with that? And, and give them as gifts. That's what I've been doing also. So thank you everyone. And uh, Patricia, I think you are next on the agenda to wrap things up. I thank am. Everybody.
I am. And I was just about to show what I just got from my sister, which is exactly those silicone bags because she did an order and it was too many in the order. So she split the order with me and not only for sandwiches and stuff, but just for what you normally would put in your refrigerator, um, you know, for foods because you, they're totally washable. So there is a ton of alternatives. It's about reduce and really that's the start of the process, turn that tap off. So with that though, our time is just about up. I, on behalf of the league again, and our co-sponsors, the Zero Waste Capital and, uh, District and the Sustainable Audit Albany, I wanna thank you all really for attending. And a special thanks to our panelists, Tina Lieberman from Zero Waste Albany, Alexis Goldsmith, who had to leave in order to go do some of her advocacy works from Beyond Plastics, and Professor Ann Ernst from Skidmore, as well as Daya Schlossberg. Thank you so much for, um, for joining and helping to educate us all. As I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to make uh, the recording available, and I know that there was a lot of information shared in the chat, so we'll share that as well as some of the other links. We'll, we'll be sending out a survey and we'd like to hear your thoughts on the program. Um, so please just take a minute. It's, it's only a few questions and the feedback is good for us. You know, all kinds of uh, constructive and positive criticism is welcome. Our league's next event will be when we will have Professor Wanky, Frankie Y. Bailey join us at our annual business meeting on June 29th to speak on criminal justice reform. So you can look, watch for that. Also, please remember that your vote is your voice. Today is the day that we vote in school elections. Have you done that yet? It's eight o'clock, you probably can't if you haven't, but this year is also a local election year. Your vote becomes so much stronger in local elections where the results can sometimes be determined by less than a dozen votes and where who you elect can more directly impact your life. If you're in the city of Albany or in Gilderland, watch for candidate forums that the league will be holding with other partner organizations for the primaries. And remember our vote411.org website so that you can be an educated voter before going to the polls. The League always could use more support, either by adding our new members or by financial donations. So if you find value in tonight's program, I ask that you go to our website, lwvalbany.org, and learn more about us and the work we're doing. So I just, once again, thank you for spending your evening with us. I know that um, there's lots of things going on, and we do really value you coming and joining us. So everybody have a great evening and have a great day tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that. And remember, kindness is important. That's my own personal message. So good night, everyone. Thank you so much.